On leaving the army, David Murray became prominent in piping circles, in Scotland and overseas, as well as becoming an author and military historian. This is how the feather bonnet originated. This is a Scots bonnet. In its original form, it was blue, and it had a string going round the edge here, which was, could be tightened to adjust the bonnet to the size of the wearer's head. As a military headdress, it lacked impact. It wasn't, it wasn't tall enough. It didn't add to the height of the wearer. So what they did was they, they stiffened it, and this was called cocking the bonnet. A cocked bonnet was one that stiffened like that with cardboard or something round inside, so that it became a pork pie um, shape. Now, even then, it didn't add much to the height of the wearer, and it wasn't impressive. So what they did was they added feathers, ostrich feathers called flats, bits of bearskin, and so on, until it de de developed into the into the feather bonnet as we know it today. Every company had its bonnet cocker. He was the man who made the bonnets which were issued like that. He made them up into feather bonnets and of course the soldiers bought the feathers themselves and paid the bonnet cocker. Uh, there's a lovely tale that's told about the Battle of Geldermarsen in uh, 1795 in Flanders where a dragoon regiment, which will remain, remain nameless, uh, was overrun and left the guns exposed and uh, the Black Watch were dispatched to get the guns back. And the general of the day said, the dragoons shall no longer wear their plumes, the Black Watch will have them. Here's a Glengarry, and you can probably see that if you take a round, a cocked bonnet like that, and flatten it, either by design or by mistake, you'll arrive with a shape very much like that, except, of course, it'll be higher at the back. And the Glengarry is merely the commander bonnet pressed flat for one reason or another, so that it'll go in a knapsack or between the straps of a knapsack or in a kit bag or something like that. And so in, over in, in time, it became tailored and uh, shaped until you get this, the shape of the modern Glengarry today. These were seen first, these flattened bonnets were seen first in 1822 when King George IV visit, paid a state visit to Edinburgh and the Highland chiefs attended with what they called their tails, their gillies, their bards, pipers and so on. So on. Now the men from Glengarry, the followers of Alistair Reynolds and Macdonello Glengarry, came in the cocked bonnet, pressed flat, probably because they'd sat in it. I don't think they'd... And anyway, that gave everyone the idea of doing it formally and tailoring the hat. And it's, in this form, it's much more convenient than in the pork pie. The blue hackle originated in 1940 when the kilt was withdrawn from the Highland regiments. General Douglas Wimberley was commanding the 1st Battalion of the Camerons at the time, and when King George VI came to inspect the battalion in the course of a visit to France in 1940, General Wimberley extracted from him agreement that the Camerons would be differentiated from now on by this blue hackle. Uh, that he felt the loss of the kilt deeply, did General Wimberley. Uh, he was a kilt fanatic. And when he heard that one of the reasons for the abolition of the kilt was because mustard gas and things, he devised mustard gas-proof underpants for the soldiers to wear. They were never officially approved or issued. Anyway, we got these blue haggles during the war, and they were a bit of a nuisance because the jocks lost them and we couldn't get any more. Then the Army Dress Committee said, no messing about till after the war, we'll sort it out then. After the war, Nobody made any move to reintroduce the blue hackle, which was quietly forgotten about, until General Wimberley became colonel of the regiment in about 1952, and the first thing we knew was uh, a plain load of blue hackles arrived. And from that day to this, the blue hackle has been worn, and it is now a treasured dress distinction of the Queen's own handlers. But that's how it started. The one thing that has never changed in our regiment's uh, history is the kilt. We have changed cap badges. We've had a button with 100 on it, then a button with 92 on it, then a sphinx, then uh, something like the current cap badge uh, with its stag's head and, and ivy wreath, uh, and now this the very beautiful cap badge that we have today. We have changed red jackets, have gone to khaki jackets, to combat kit. Uh, you've had uh, different forms of sporans, and you've had different forms of uh, shoes and uh, different types of uniform. But the one thing, the only thing that has never changed has been the Gordon Tartan. Now, in 1943, when the regiment had its 150th anniversary, King George VI, out of the blue, 
said that the camera, the pipers of the Camerons, he conferred on the pipers of the Camerons the right to wear the royal Stuart tartan. Well, here again, this was received with complete equanimity. And uh, it's uh, difficult to believe, but nothing, whatever, was done about it in the 1st Battalion. And we stayed in, abroad until 1948, and when we came back, we had no Royal Stuart kilts or planes. And the commanding, the general officer commanding at Edinburgh Castle, and the Scottish command was General, uh, general Christensen, who said, you know, really, you must get sorted out. So, of course, we had to buy 24 plaids and acquire 24 kilts. Where we got them from, I do not know. I know we bought the plaids. Where the kilts came from, I don't know. And the pipe band turned out in the Royal Stuart, and everyone said they looked much better in the Cameron Tartan. Uh, so that when amalgamation time came in 1961, the pipers went back into the Cameron Tartan, and nobody gave the Royal Stuart another thought. It's a rather lovely story. Um, it relates actually to the first battle that the 92nd Gordon Highlanders took part in at Egmont op Zee, where they were under that famous general Sir John Moore, who was actually their brigade commander at the time. And in, during the action at Egmont op Zee, Moore got knocked off his horse. He was stunned by a cannonball. It passed, literally hit him gently on the head, presumably quite gently, but he was knocked unconscious fell from his horse and was in danger of being trampled in the melee, as you can imagine, I mean, in, in close quarter action. And he could just remember being grabbed by two soldiers of the 92nd and taken to the rear where he was put on a bank and when he began to come round in consciousness, they left him. He could remember quite definitely that they were 92nd, uh, presumably from, from the Tartan. Uh, and he put out a reward for them. He wanted to uh, acknowledge their, their kindness and, and obviously saving his life. But of course the custom in the Highlands in those days was that you did not accept uh, anything for saving life. I mean, there was no question of accepting a reward. So the two never came forward. Uh, Moore was always very touched by this. And when he was later knighted and, his, uh, his, and given a coat of arms, his coat of arms has as a supporter a soldier of the Light Infantry, which was his own regiment, but a soldier of the 92nd. And uh, the 92nd, who then were to serve again under him when he was a general in the retreat to Corona and served at Corona, and at various stages during the retreat to Corona, formed part of his bodyguard, were so fond of him that when he was killed at Corona, uh, they decided they would wear black buttons in their spats in memory of Sir John Moore, and the officers wore black uh, lace in their gold shoulder cords, and today you'll find a black line in our shoulder cords and we're the only regiment of the British Army who does that and the only Highland regiment to wear black buttons in our spats. <laughs>